Good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Justin Weir. I'm the chair of the Slavic department. I wanted to say uh, that I feel especially privileged because so many people have contacted me in the last weeks and uh, days to express their sadness about uh, Svetlana's passing, but also and primarily to share sort of great love for her, um, to share how she was an inspiration for them, inspiration to become teachers, inspiration to become scholars. Um, and I think people just wanted to be like Svetlana uh, <laughs> in so many ways. Uh, she was fascinating. Um, so I am the, the bearer of so many greetings uh, by others who couldn't be here, uh, and I wanted to say that. I also wanted to just welcome all of you and take a minute to say thank you to all of the people who have helped uh, put the memorial uh, together today, where we have a chance to uh, get together with one another and talk and spend time thinking of Svetlana. First and foremost, uh, we're incredibly grateful uh, for the support of Svetlana's family, her mother and father, Musa and Yuri Goldberg, who are with us, uh, her husband, Dana Villa, who is also here with us. Uh, I wanted to take a moment to say thanks to David Damrosh, the chair of comparative literature. Anyone who knows David knows that he has been indefatigable in helping put um, today's event together. Uh, we've been helped by the staff in the Comparative Literature Department, by Isor Minot, and by Melissa Cardin, and by Susie DeSormo in the Slavic Department. And of course, so many friends and colleagues have pitched in uh, and have helped us in these last several weeks. Friends, especially close friends, like Tamara Bramov um, and Masha Gessen, and many, many former and current students, graduate students, putting up Svetlana's art, helping us to create the event um, and make today possible. So I just wanted to say welcome. Uh, and uh, I believe David Damrush will say uh, a word, too, and then we'll get started. Uh, and I just want to also uh, express my, my great pleasure to see everyone here. Thanks especially to uh, Deanna Sorensen and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences who uh, helped uh, support this, as well as to uh, Homi Baba and the Mahindra Center. Uh, we have a reception following uh, here. And then, as you see on the program, uh, we're starting an exhibit, which thanks to the generosity of Yuri and Musa Goldberg, will be up in Dana Palmer for the school year of some of Svetlana's amazing uh, visual art. Uh, really worth uh, coming over to, to see. We'll have a little opening just uh, at 7.30 following that. Uh, and among the many tributes to Svetlana have been not only personal uh, emails and contacts, but, but quite a lot, as you can see on our department websites, uh, of published tributes from all kinds <coughs> of venues on different continents. Really quite exceptional, I think, the outpouring of, of writing uh, in, in her memory. It seems completely appropriate. Uh, so uh, this will be an opportunity for a variety of people from across the range of Svetlana's uh, life to speak. Uh, and, and we'll actually begin with a, a short just arrived late addition to the program, a two minute video uh, of Svetlana and some images of her art uh, just uh, done this summer. So this is really quite an extraordinary thing and just came in. So we'll begin with that and then proceed uh, to the program proper. Vladimir Nabokov walked by the Viking plaque near Charles River 
and dreamt of Amirosia, the magical land that would join northern Russia and southern New England. Charles River Walks became an important ritual for cryptogamists all over the world. And our first uh, speaker is Donald Fanger. I met Svetlana in 1983 when she arrived at Harvard to undertake a doctorate in comparative literature. Among the first complete courses she took was a seminar of mine on the city and literature, for which I somehow persuaded her to work on <coughs> Osip Mandelstam's Egyp <coughs> Egyptian stamp. She had arrived as a Hispanist and had no plans to work in the area of Russian literature, I suspect because of its largely straight-jacketed and dreary treatment in Soviet education. I still remember the originality and brilliance of her contribution to that seminar and the air of discovery that pervaded it. Later, she gave me to understand that it was that experience that had put her on the way to making <coughs> Russian literature a major item in her multifaceted career, and I never doubted it because I didn't want to doubt it. <coughs> The very idea was and is too deep a source of wonderment and pride. Let me quote a short paragraph of the young Svetlana's early paper because it suggests so much of what was to find development and expression one way or another in her persona and in her writing. The Egyptian stamp she wrote problematizes the notions of individual and biography, in quote marks, and questions the validity of both the biographical genre and the genre of the novel that focuses on the human figure and its psychological conflicts. It is not just a demonstration of the end of the novel, nor is it enti an entirely avant-garde narrative. It stages the very act of the collision of different values and ideas, something she was particularly sensitive to. Its sense of modernity is defined through a reappreciation of the Russian tradition and a new eclecticism. Her singularity went so deep. I recall her returning from a conference in Russia and telling me with amusement of a young man there who asked who she was. She answered, Ya Gavritsky professor, I am a Harvard professor. And the Russian answered sarcastically, right, and I'm the minister of culture. <laughs> well, she was a Harvard professor, among other things. And what I'll miss most alongside the intellectual and aesthetic surprises she so regularly delivered is her presence, her voice above all, that comforting and engaging purr with its gentle, almost southern cadences, and of course the more than movie star smile that regularly accompanied it, sometimes humorous, but always a sign of the instinctive pleasure she took in deploying that formidable mind and mischievous spirit that so many of us were lucky enough to know for far too short a, a time. Julia? 
In the summer of 1998, I was in Moscow for a research trip as a graduate student. This is me speaking. Svetlana, I, I will read from her book, too. I sat on the steps of the Lenin Library in the glowering shadow of Dostoevsky. Svetlana and I had arranged to meet there. I had exhausted myself walking around the city. When Svetlana first saw me, she exclaimed, you have no face. <laughs> that was a direct translation of the Russian and I will always remember her saying that to me, especially because of what came next. Svetlana took me to a homey restaurant where she revived me with hearty borscht and nourishing conversation. During that same visit to Moscow, Svetlana invited me to hear her speak at a conference and to an art exhibition. I was grateful to Svetlana for being my guide, for modeling the compassion that I hope I have learned and showing me the joy of discovery at every turn. When I think of Svetlana as a scholar and teacher, I picture a type of firework that I first saw over the Charles River in the 1990s, a shimmering spiral casting sparks in every direction. Reading commonplaces, you're dazzled by Svetlana's gifts for thinking expansively, drawing connections, and challenging received knowledge. Her book teaches about the power of collectively imagined common ground and the irony that such imaginings can generate, quoting, the commonplace is a mythical site from which intellectuals perpetually distance themselves only to write elegies to the lost communality, end quote. Svetlana brings erudition and empathy to her analysis of cultural artifacts. She shows how to read closely and listen carefully. I first heard about material culture studies from Svetlana, and I remember feeling at the time as if I discovered a community to which I could potentially belong. Commonplaces introduced me to <coughs> Hannah Arendt, to Walter Benjamin and to the pensioner Luba, whose evocative collection of keepsakes takes center stage in the chapter titled Living in Common Places. I'm going to read a few excerpts from that chapter. The communal apartment was a specifically Soviet form of urban living, a memory of a never implemented utopian communist design, an institution of social control, and the breeding ground of police informants between the 1920s and 1980s. Here, privacy was prohibited only to be reinvented again, against all odds. Kommunalka, a term of endearment and deprecation, came into existence after post-revolutionary expropriation and resettlement of private apartments in urban centers. The archaeology of the communal apartment reveals what happens when utopian designs are put into practice, inhabited and placed into history, individual and collective. Walter Benjamin wrote that to live means to leave traces. Perhaps this is the best definition of the private, to leave traces for oneself and for others, memory traces of which one cannot be deprived. A Soviet room in the communal apartment reveals an obsession with commemoration and preservation. The minimum of privacy is not even a room, but a corner in a room, a hidden space behind the partition. Luba has carefully arranged the objects of her si on her sideboard. There's a big plastic apple brought from her native Belarusian village, a Chinese thermos with bright floral ornaments, a naturalistic porcelain dog, three bottles containing different glass flowers, daisies and some exotic red flowers, not without a touch of elegance, a samovar, a set of folk-style porcelain, Soviet-made porcelain cups. You see, I have it all here. It's my still life, she said proudly when I photographed her room. It's curious that she would use the artistic term still life to describe it. She called it a natsurmort, a term familiar from the obligatory high school excursions to the museum. To her, the display is obviously imbued with an aesthetic quality as much as with personal memories. She almost never drinks from her porcelain cups. They're precious objects of decoration, not for everyday use. Indeed, there's something pleasing and cheerful in the brightness and unabashed eclecticism of the objects in contrast to the bleak uniformity of communal corridors. The still life appears to be removed from historical narrative, and from narrative as <coughs> such, it reflects a conception of time as habit, repetition, and long duration. It is, to use Norman Bryson's expression, the sleep of culture. But it is hard to imagine a still life in a culture where one major devastation follows the other, where habit, repetition, and everyday stability are so difficult to sustain. In Russia, one can only speak about nostalgia for a still life, for a sustaining everyday materiality in the face of continuing crises. Luba's collection of Soviet ready-mades, objects of trivial private utopias and of mass aesthetics framed by the glass of the commode as if it were a museum exhibit, is a kind of monument to that desire for a still life, for a life that does not rush anywhere in a whirlpool of uncontrollable change.
Just a word to introduce this first uh, musical excerpt, which, of which you'll find the text in the, in the back, La Llave de España. Uh, it was written by Flora Yagoda, Bosnian Jewish composer in Ladino, the medieval uh, Spanish Jewish language, uh, in Sarajevo during the Bosnian uh, conflict during the Civil War there. Uh, it's exactly the kind of reflective nostalgia that Svetlana loved, lingering in ruins. And, and if you come over to the exhibit later today or in, in this year, you will find one of the most striking of her photos is called Leaving Sarajevo, here performed by our, our dear colleague Luis Hero Negron. <laughs> Donde está la llave que estaba en Cachún? Mis nonus la trujeron con grande dolor. Mis nonus la trujeron con grande dolor de la casa de España, de España. De la casa de España, de España. Sueño. De España, sueños de España. ¿Dónde está la llave que estaba en Cachún? Mis nonus la trujeron con grande amor. Dijeron a los fillos: Esto es el corazón de nuestra casa de España, de España. De nuestra casa de España, de España, sueños de España, sueños de España. ¿Dónde está la llave que estaba en Cachún? Mis nonus la trujeron con grande amor. La dieron a los nietos a meterla a cachón. Nuestra llave de España, de España. Nuestra llave de España, de España. Sueños de España. Sueños de España. Sueños de España, sueños de España. Hello, I'm Bill Todd from uh, the Slavic Department in Comparative Literature. Svetlana and I sat next to each other at a luncheon for new faculty in September 1988, the first of many meals we would share. We were friends and colleagues for nearly 30 years. In all that time, she never failed to surprise, delight, and inspire with her brilliant formulations, oral and written, her artwork, which was no less varied and prolific than her critical writing, and her ability, unprecedented in my experience, to get right to the heart of a problem, to be always original without trying to be, and like her admired Walter Benjamin and Hannah Arendt, never confusing the aesthetic, the ethical, and the political, although she had a rare talent for bringing them into close proximity. I've been trying in vain to come to grips with her passing. It happened, of course, decades too soon. But of the many surprises she offered us, this was the only one that wasn't joyous, luminescent, and mind-changing. And perhaps that's why it remains so incomprehensible and so devastating. In winter 1992, just after the fall of the Soviet Union, I went to Russia to conduct archival research. Many friends advised me not to go because of the unsettled situation. Just about everything that could go wrong on my trip to Moscow did go wrong. Delayed visa, delayed flight, lost luggage, confused driver, drunken porter, 
hotel guards were in camouflage, accessorized with Kalashnikovs. <laughs> I made my way to my room, flicked on the television, and there was our Svetlana <laughs> on Russian TV <clears throat> explaining the American presidential campaign in her colorful <laughs> native language. Her take on the wimp factor, complex mushskoi nipolnitsanisti, left me rolling on the floor in laughter. Somehow she had made the world seem smaller, less threatening, more intelligible. Her unfailing humor and courage had that effect. Then there were her books. She'd already finished the first when we met, but I was privileged to read the typescripts of the remaining ones, tasked with light fact-checking and inserting definite articles into her <laughs> astonishingly fresh and creative English. <laughs> These four books are filled with surprises, dead critics and living authors, refreshingly sympathetic views of late Soviet and post-Soviet everyday life, dinosaurs, cyberspace, dazzling juxtapositions across periods, continents, languages, genre, and conceptual barriers, <coughs> utterly unpredictable readings of fashionable theories, which he never used as critical algorithms, but rather as challenges and points of departure. I knew that she was reading Michel de Certeau, Pierre Bourdieu, Maurice Blanchot, but how could this prepare me for her chapter, Welcome to the Communal Apartment, with its now immortalized Uncle Fedia? It brings me joy to reread it and to remember the sympathetic laughter it occasioned. These are just the surprises within the books, but at each step of the way she was exploring and mastering new aesthetic forms drama, documentary film, essays, short stories, a multi-layered and intricate novel, installations, photography. Not as idle experiments for the drawer, but for public performance. We happily made our way out to Charleston, to the Carpenter Center, into Boston, to the Davis Center, to the art space on Garden Street to share in these occasions. Because as surprising as they all were, <coughs> They were surprises to be shared with her friends, parents, and students. A party or dinner would follow, as Svetlana had the rare ability to make her art and scholarship social events, the subject of ongoing conversation. I'll close by citing a programmatic ending from her first book, Death in Quotation Marks. It captures, I believe, a precious constant and an ongoing quest in her wonderfully surprising, unpredictable, and always generous career. Quote, perhaps what the current fin de siècle demands is not an apocalyptic or panic criticism predicated on death, but a critical rethinking of the process of living and making. Not what Jean Baudrillard celebrates as theoretical violence, but a theoretical sympathy and in intersubjective communication. In short, we have to recover a certain kind of non-totalizable and anti-authoritarian ethics that helps to put together the making of poetry, love, and criticism. Yes, I want to say some, uh, to express some, some words before about Svetlana. I will read some extracts from the future of nostalgia. Uh, your name, Svetlana, Svet, means lights in Russian. But one as aspect of Jewish identity is to receive light from the other rather than having one's own. This you did throughout your life here at the university as, as elsewhere. We met 40 years ago in Leningrad, and we could not speak to each other. But the words remain. You were my first cousin. You hosted me here at Harvard two years ago to speak 
of the shared destiny of our families in the Gulag. So I will now read a text of yours that I translated 10 years ago for a French journal. It reminds me of the status of the word that, as the French poet Paul Eluard has written, lives forever. I quote, the word can lift up more earth than the grave digger. From the introdu introduction of the future of nostalgia. Nostalgia from nostos, return home, and algia, longing, is, long is a longing for a home that no longer exists or has never existed. Nostalgia is a sentiment of loss and displacement, but is also a romance with own own fantasy. Nostalgic love can only survive in long distance relationship. A cinematic image of nostalgia is a double exposure or a serial position of two images of home and abroad, past and present, dream and everyday life. The moment we try to force it into a single image, it breaks the frame or burns the surface. I had long held a prejudice against nostalgia. I remember when I had just emigrated from the Soviet Union to the United States in 1981, strangers often asked me, do you miss it? I never quite knew how to answer. Not, but it's not what you think, I said. Or yes, but it's not what you think. I was told at the Soviet border that I would never be able to return. So nostalgia seems like a waste of time and an, unford an, an unfordable luxury. I had only just learned to answer the question, how are you? With an efficient, <laughs> fine. <laughs> instead of the Russian roundabout discussion of life's unbearable <laughs> shades of gray. <laughs> At that time, being a resident alien seems the only appropriate form of identity which I slowly began to accept. Nostalgia caught up with me in unexpected ways. 10 years after my departure, I returned to my native city. Phantoms of familiar faces and facades, the smell of frying cutlets in the cluttered kitchen, a fint of urine and swamps in the decadent hallways, a gray drizzle over the Neva River, the rubble of reconnection, it all touched me and left me numb. What was most striking was a different sense of time. It felt like traveling into another temporal zone where everybody was late, but somehow there, were, there was always time. For better or worse, this sense of temporal luxury quickly disappeared during perestroika. The excess of time for conversation and reflection was a perverse outcome of a socialist <coughs> economy. Time was not a precious com commodity. The shortage of, of private space allowed people to make private use of their time. Retrospectively and most likely nostalgically, I, I thought that the slow rhythm of reflective time made possible the dream of freedom. In the end, the only antidote for the dictatorship of nostalgia might be, might be nostalgic dissidence. While restorative nostalgia returns and rebuilds one homeland with parano paranoiac determination, reflective nostalgia fears returning with the same passion. Instead of recreation of the lost home, reflective nostalgia can foster a creative self. Home, after all, is not a gated community. Paradise on Earth might turn out to be another Potemkin village with no exit. Nostalgia can be both a social disease and a creative emotion, a poison and a cure. The dream of imagined homelands cannot and should not come to life. They can have a more important impact on improving social and political conditions in the present as ideals, not as fairy tale come true. Sometimes <coughs> it's preferable, at least in the view of this nostalgic, to leave dreams alone let them be no more than no less than dream, no guide less lines for the future. Acknowledging our collective and individual nostalgia, we can smile at them, revealing a line of imperfect teeth stained by the ecological impure water of our native cities. I write of melancholy by being busy to avoid melancholy, claimed Robert Burton in his Anatomy of Melancholy. I have tried to do the same with nostalgia survivor of the 20th century. We are all nostalgic for a time, 
when we were not nostalgic. But there seems to be no way back. Good evening, I'm Giuliana Bruno, a professor in Visual and Environmental Studies and affiliate faculty in the Grado School of Design. I met Svetlana here at Harvard in 1990. As very green junior faculty, we <coughs> formed a collective of young theorists together with Eva Lyer Burkhardt and Michael Hayes and had lots of food for thought, of course. In 2005, Svetlana and I started teaching a course together called Imagining the City film, literature, and the visual arts. A literary scholar, fiction writer, who in recent years also became known as media artist, Svetlana, as we know, had a remarkable vitality, tangible curiosity for the visual world, and a vibrant intellectual passion for ideas. We shared cultural adventures with our students, traveling across theory, literature, architecture, visual arts, and media. Svetlana took much pleasure in making <laughs> historical, literary, and artistic portraits of many cities on the world's map. Her imaginative thought was equally at home with words or images, and she used photography to teach students <laughs> how to see. To instruct them to detect ideology <coughs> and censorship, she would routinely pull up a black and white photograph photo of communist party members in the Red Square. The widely circulated photograph had been doctored, before Photoshop, she would alert students, and she found the untouched original in the archives. She would then show both images, one after the other, and ask them, what is different? The students were looking very hard for big symbolic signs and could not <coughs> immediately tell. Look closely, she say, look here on the floor. Aha, they would finally see it. And what was different? A tiny little piece of garbage was gone from the pavement. <laughs> no more dirty streets. A little touch up and the country's dirty laundry had been concealed. With this refuse, the unwanted image of the city had been erased from view. <coughs> that little detail spoke volumes. It showed how attractive Svetlana was by the refuse, the everyday, the banal, the marginal, the ruin, the gap, the missing link, and the transit space. She liked to reveal the, un the unseen that hides in full view. Her literary critical gaze, equally literary and critical, brought to light the unmemorable and enhanced what she called the unmonumental. And she often taught students this art of seeing by displaying her own work and artistic process. In the dark classroom, her images flickering for 16 seconds in syncopated slow motion would hover as mnemonic ghosts, offering flashes of memory in motion. Her pictures were touches of phantasmagoria. Cultural memory and estrangement were key concepts in Svetlana's pedagogy, and this mirrored her research interest, especially developed in her acclaimed books, The Future of Nostalgia and Another Freedom. Yet Svetlana's way of looking at the past in her class and in her work was not nostalgic in the traditional sense. History attracted her because it could reveal potentialities not yet expressed and thereby lead to potential futures. Walter Benjamin's angel would inspire her to teach by looking back while always thrusting forward. That image of the Red Square she showed our students was part of her own memories, having grown up a child of the Soviet Union. The urban archaeologies we taught together were places we traveled to as well as inhabited and included the cities of our own birth, Naples and Leningrad. We enjoyed coming up with comparisons and differences between cities to tell the urban tale of stasis and motion, all the while looking at such urban vital matters as light and water, stones and ruins, bridges and museums. Because Svetlana shared their research process with their students, they could learn how to think and see, even by osmosis, becoming privy to a creative intellectual journey. Step by step, we followed her last fascinating project to trace the journey of her migration in order to uncover the concealed aspect of Jewish and Soviet histories. As we imaginarily were taken to a transit camp on the outskirts of Vienna, we could feel how momentous this project is 
given the state of transit camps for migrants and refugees all over the world. But despite the dark implications, Svetlana would never make this project or anything else really sound heavy. Always ironic and playful, she liked to pretend that her discoveries in art, as in writing, were serendipitous and sometimes even came as an error. As you will see in the art exhibition curated by our valiant teaching fellows, Jesse Chapins and Serge Riapo, she would pull up a photograph of a printer at the wrong time and voila, a, an exposure, double exposure would show up or the trace of her hand would appear. But no, this was not a mistake. The kind of error that Svetlana practiced was rather a form of erring. Her so-called error was a departure from principles, from defined paths. An act of navigation of the main course of modernity, Svetlana's erratic scholarly investigations were determined for us in the land of the off-modern, making brilliant lateral moves in the side alleys of critical modernity, experimenting with nostalgic technology. This woman would even dare to go embarrassingly astray in pursuit of the dazzling creative excess that eccentrically lies off-center. Yes, Svetlana embodied the off-modern character, practiced a real form of cultural flanerie, and took pleasure as well in going off to world traveling to lecture internationally. She would always be excited to come back to share her findings with her students and teach them experimentally about a favorite urban topic, cosmopolitanism. Svetlana believed that cities are cosmopolitan communities where individuals from varying location could enter relationships of mutual respect despite their differing points of view. Such relationships included intellectual friendships, the kind that nourished us both, often struck up across borders. In her wonderful essay, Scenography of Friendship, Svetlana pondered about the friendship between two writers. She described it as having, and I quote, luminous opacity, diasporic intimacy, and asymmetrical reciprocity. To love a friend, she claimed, <coughs> is to recognize the difference and estrangement of the other. Friendship, Svetlana insisted, is not a conventional intimacy. Rather, it is an elective affinity, end quote. An intimate affair indeed, yet connected to broader public existence, worldly play, and open expansion of the self. My dear Svetlana, worldly and lively friend, we all miss you, but your spirit lives on in your students and in your brilliant work. Hi. Um, uh, my name is Tamara Abramov, and I, uh, I'm a friend of Svetlana's. When Svetlana and I first met in 2001, we plunged head on into a conversation about Israel, as one would. Svetlana said she had never been to Israel and defiantly added, as if anticipating my projected disapproval, that she had no interest in going. <laughs> she was pressured to immigrate there from the transit camp. Representatives of the Israeli immigration agency, the Sochnut, who ran the camp had guilt tripped her and others to make Aliyah, to move to Israel, but she wanted to go west, not east. She said she was a diasporic Jew and that the project of Israel was not one she cared to engage with in a non-theoretical way. <laughs> <laughs> My own relationship to Israel being what it was, I never insisted on having further explanations. I knew that like all of Svetlana's choices, it was one informed by unconventional, independent considerations. But the time in which Svetlana and I met also saw seismic shifts to the landscape markers of her life. Throughout the 90s and the very early 2000s, her life was stretched between the US and Russia with long European and East European layovers. These were the coordinates of her research, her archives, her intellectual commitments, and her public persona. But by the end of nostalgia and the early 2000s, Svetlana, who in her writing and her art had documented leaving the same places, if you go to the exhibition, you'll see Sarajevo, St. Petersburg, New York, leaving the same places again and again 
reworking through these departures an original mythical exodus from which there was no return. Now Svetlana had left Russia for what seemed like the last time. She could not and did not want to examine leaving it again. The disappointment at the exhilaration of the 90s and the tragedy of the 2000s did not lend itself to another parting. And she went through an intellectual disinvestment. She lost interest. And so she was looking for another marker, a new coordinate, another faraway home that in its divergence from the US would make America home. Svetlana could only make sense of the place she was at when there was another place or places she was absent from. Another place where she actually perhaps wanted to be. Another place she could be happy about not being at. <laughs> another place from which life seen here made sense. She started preparing her retraction on the Israeli visit. It was only much later in that decade and around marital uncertainty that she finally accepted an invitation from the Hebrew University and made her first trip there. But that trip was preceded by a long gestation period. Svetlana first sensed that she was, she was going to accept the invitation and only then came up with a theoretical framework to account for it. <laughs> Why did she change her mind? I have a hypothesis, one I never discussed with her. In the tradition of Shklovsky, Arendt, and Mandelstam, whom she loved so much, Svetlana conceptualized her understanding of Jewishness and her own Jewish self-stylization in relation to a cosmopolitanism that was not bound to a place. Her grandmother, to whom she was deeply attached, was arrested and sent to the Gulag for Jewishness coded as cosmopolitanism. In a deconstructive move, and in direct response to the Soviet charges against her grandmother, Svetlana embraced Jewishness as cosmopolitanism. Only now, cosmopolitanism had been refashioned as freedom, set defiantly against cosmopolitanism as a faux political criminal charge that results in an arrest or freedom loss. I think Svetlana was worried that Israel will confine her idea of Jewish as cosmopolitan freedom and will constrict her ability to fight and win her grandmother's battle, the battle to invest Jewishness with positive content that was not only a ticket out of discrimination. But when she finally went to Israel in 2010, she saw that Israel, instead of constricting her definition of Jewishness as good cosmopolitan freedom, challenged her to expand it. <coughs> she found out that attachment to a place is not at the privation of one's freedom. She was immediately embraced. She connected to local artistic and academic circles, sat in all the trendy cafes, and swindled her way into the Gordon Pool, just <laughs> like a local. She was there nearly every summer for the last five or six years, sweeping Tel Aviv where she felt perfectly at home with her beauty, her energy, and her ideas. In preparation for her first trip, she decided she wanted to learn Hebrew. We met weekly from 2009 to 2011. There are recordings of these lessons on one of her computers. We are laughing so hard, you can hardly make sense of what we are saying. She said she was a very bad student because she hardly ever practiced writing and reading her letters, and she mostly did not do her homework, which is true. <laughs> <laughs> Yet she wasn't a bad student, on the contrary, she was a perfect student. She had a feeling for the pitch and the music and the warmth of the language and for everything in Hebrew that was funny and did not make logical sense. She had played with the nonsensical as a native, as only she could, and wove whole stories around it. She made us laugh endlessly. She thought it was a burden for me, but in fact, I could never wait for these lessons. I never laughed at myself with such ease as I had then. We had the best time. I wish she were here so I could thank her for them. In our Hebrew lessons, we often sang Hebrew songs together, and I was asked to introduce it. So this is one of them. It's called Tfilah, or prayer. <coughs> I will only add briefly, the last time I saw Svetlana was in Puerto Rico, January 4th of this year, 
We were dancing salsa on the vestibule of a hotel where David Stern and his wife were staying. I could never imagine that I would have to honor her memory by trying to impersonate an Israeli pop singer <laughs> with a Hebrew version of the peace prayer attributed to St. Francis. So I hope she'll forgive me. <laughs> במקום שבו שגשוג אין אחדות, במקום שבו טעות אין אמת, ובמקום שבו ג'ספק פן פן אמונה במקום שבו יש ייאוש תן תקווה במקום שבו יש ללימון במקום שבו יש סף שמחה עשה שלא אתאווה להיות מנוחם אלא מנחם שלא להיות מובן אל המבין שלא להיות אחוז אל האוהב כי כאשר נשכח את עצמנו נזכה לקבל וכאשר נסלחת יישא לה לנו, לנו, לנו וכאשר נעמוד ניוולד לך ינצח וכאשר נעמוד ניוולד לך ינצח וכאשר נעמוד ניוולד לך ינצח I'm a student and a friend of Svetlana's. And I'm very honored to be here um, today in front of so many familiar and so many unfamiliar faces, reminded of how many of us um, were touched by Svetlana's vibrant life. Svetlana generously left us the overflowing riches of her writings, which bring, as always, illumination and sometimes even some consolation in our loss. Yet what I miss both despite and because of her writings are her ways of being and of doing. Today I will recall three of these, teaching, mourning, and making. For Svetlana's ways of being somehow irrepressibly turned into making. She even had a term for it, of course, co-creating. Among her co-creators were the people around her as well as thinkers, artists, philosophers with whom she engaged passionately. Co-creators were also the unmemorable landscapes registered in her cosmopolitan travels, city hydrants, and broken technology that made their way into her art. Indeed, she turned the most improbable things into co-creators, including the process that we are going through today, mourning. So we can learn to mourn for Svetlana, from Svetlana. But let's start with teaching. 
Where does one start except maybe at the very beginning of her class, when she arrived with a sparkle and in, in her eyes and a handout <coughs> of quotations? <coughs> I searched through all my graduate school archive, expecting ice-breaking Nabokovian quips, like her favorite, if parallel lines do not meet, it is not because they cannot, but because they have other things to do. <laughs> Although I knew that she did not shy away from sitting Saint Teresa next to Mallarmé at her seminar table, her kind of comparative literature. Her mark was also in the accent she inflected all these languages with, an accent that, gracing a brilliant eloquence, lured the many other accents around the table out of their silences. Svetlana also left a trace of her impetuousness in the handout's misprint. She didn't waste precious time fixing typos. Instead, she composed a manifesto on human error and wrote an exquisite theory of the misprint that addresses what she saw as a gap in our ethical reckoning with the gulag. She ended that class on the figurative death of the author, warning us against effacing the vul vulnerable human body, its life and literal death behind our text. An image that she created as an act of mourning on the day of Jacques Derrida's death illustrates this warning and also shows Vetlana at work co-creating even while mourning. Next to the image she wrote, quote, in the absence of a mourning ritual, I found myself taking photographs of the fallen page, touching the words in the light, casting shadows, animating the lines, end of quote. There's much to be said about this work that projects Svetlana's fingers, described in the text as warm, foreign, and ghostly, playing with a text that so famously denied its outside. It's the ore. Suffice it to say that this play with light is no light play, but a distillation of a lifetime of rigorous engagement with Derrida started in death, in quotation marks, her first book. For me today, what matters is that her mourning is an act of co-creation, an act whereby she conjures his ghost at the risk of her own warm fingers turning ghostly. Svetlana artfully handles here not just the page, but the essential part of mourning that we so often avoid, the fear of seeing our own mortality in another's. In a tribute I wrote on the day of her funeral, I shared this photograph, which I had promised to send her during our last conversation, a promise that I had failed to keep. What I, did what I did not mention then is that there, these are just two door handles of the hundreds that I had been photographing in the past few years, somewhat obsessively. <laughs> Unlike Svetlana, I'm no photographer. I take mostly pictures of my kids with my cell phone. But I took all these pictures, not even stopping when suspicious neighbors accused me once of taking the photographs as part of a burglary scene. <laughs> Then, while mourning for Svetlana through reading her, I came across this <coughs> phrase in a story sh she wrote just this spring. Quote, in 1986 in Boston, I started to have dreams of my old Russian house. In one dream, I stand in front of my house and I try to enter it, but I can't. I don't remember what the doorknob looked like. End of quote. It was only then that I realized that all my door handles, Freud's included, were door handles whose owners had been variously displaced. While artfully <coughs> confessing her vulnerability, the nightmare of the loss of her own home key, Svetlana's writing gave me, in a flash, the key to my hundred door handles. Just as I thought I was reading her, she read me right back, getting, as usual, to the very heart of the matter. On the drive to what turned out to be my last visit to Svetlana's house on a quiet July morning, I had to explain to my seven-year-old daughter, Veronica, that she could not see Svetlana and make art with her, as was their habit, because Svetlana was not well enough to receive her. When I stepped out of the car, Veronica handed me a gray rose that she has somehow managed to quietly make from some old clay found in the depths of her messy car seat. Seeing me out, Svetlana insisted on coming out of the house to thank Veronica for the rose. As the car drove off, Svetlana told Veronica, we'll make more art together. It's a promise I know she will keep.
when I read Svetlana's work, I often am struck by <laughs> darkness <laughs> and the <laughs> return of light. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, often, I often encounter an echo of a, a conversation or a class with her, often a, a, a verbal phrase or even the warmth of a single favorite word. And, uh, and this is a brief excerpt from her, her book, Another Freedom, in which I recognize the trace of a conversation that I had with her in the year 2000 when I was a first year PhD student here and her research assistant. And she said, Jacob, go to Widener Library and get me books about cosmos. <laughs> The mysterious category of imagination has been crucial for the philosophical conception of freedom since the early modern era. With the help of imagination, we can conceive of what our senses do not perceive, as if connecting the invisible within us to the invisible in the world, discovering the inner cosmos that enables us to confront the cosmos beyond our reach. Imagination bridges the gulf between visible and invisible, or to go beyond the metaphors of sight, also between the overheard and silenced, the well thought through and the unthinkable. It devises all kinds of transports through metaphors, similes, anamorphoses, allegories, and symbols. Imagination entertains the hypothetical, moves through leaps, lapses, and ellipses, and engages in double vision. Only through imagination does one have the freedom to picture otherwise of thinking what if and not only what is. Imagination navigates the space between emotional and rational, defying any single law, but often developing laws of its own. Romantic and modernist artists believe that the capacity to imagine is the human way of imitating the act of creation itself, not merely the created world. Imagination is not entirely free of cultural commonplaces, but is not bound by the borders of a single system of coordinates. It is heteronymous and moves from one country to another without visa restrictions. Imagination bridges not only spatial but also temporal discontinuities, connecting no longer and not yet, as well as could have been and might become. Thank you. Hi. Um, first, thanks for coming. I'm Dana Villa, Svetlana's husband, um, and this was quite unexpected. Um, I want to just begin. I'm going to read something that some of you might have heard at her funeral. I apologize for the repetition. But I'm going to start by recalling our first real argument in 1992. We were driving somewhere in western Massachusetts listening to NPR, as is all of our wants. And um, something came on about the discovery in Africa of bones of one of the missing links between humans and the apes. And Svetlana, listening to this, said, I'm not descended from any monkey. Um, <laughs> I slammed on the brakes, pulled over to the side of the road, and sort of tried to explain Charles Darwin, um, not successfully. And Svetlana stuck to her guns, and basically she had her own theory, as other people <laughs> sort of explained. She theorized everything. But this theory was um, perhaps less, one of her less successful ones, or maybe it, <laughs> She thought that ultimately she came from another planet um, <laughs> via, of course, aliens. Okay. Svetlana, as you all know, was one of a kind. This is a cliche, of course one that is rarely true of those to whom it is applied. Yet everyone who knew Svetlana, whether as an author, a teacher, a colleague, or an artist, a novelist, and even a friend, would say it was true of her. She was an utterly unique presence, intellectually vibrant and joyous, absolutely untainted by the petty vices of academia. She was, as Nabokov might have said, that rarest of rare creatures, a lovable professor. And I should immediately add, she was lovable not simply because of her personality, but more importantly, because of her mind. It was her sheer mental energy, her love of experience, of texts, ideas, art, and visual culture generally, 
that made her so astonishing and so astonishingly creative. I'm certain that here I'm merely repeating what others have already said, but it is, I think, essential to understand what Svetlana was. Namely, she was an original thinker and perhaps more importantly, an original writer. Now these two are cliches, but again, they are cliches that are rarely true of those to whom they are routinely applied. They were and are true of Svetlana. Compared to her, many of the original thinkers and writers we are invited to applaud often look positively herd-like. Now, it may seem strange that her husband should focus on her mind rather than on more personal matters. I do so for the simple reason that that mind defined her. Of course, she had great human warmth, great humor, and great receptivity to experience. These qualities are far from nothing. Many of us, myself included, would be happy to have just one of them. But they all pale in relation to that mind, her mind, a mind the like of which I have never encountered, either in person or in writing. To have a mind like that, one so full of ideas, one so unconstrained by ideology, constipated professionalism, or disciplinary conventions, to have a mind like that snuffed at at so young an age is beyond tragic. I can only say that like many of you, I don't know how I will live without her and without the constant surprise and illumination her mind provided. I do take, however, more than a little solace in the fact that she achieved what so many of us try and fail to achieve, a full, genuine, and utterly uncompromised individuality. Many of us talk or write about self-fashioning. Svetlana is the only person I know, or I should say knew, who actually lived up to that impossible, almost impossible ideal contained in that now seemingly banal phrase. It is a phrase she introduced me to the year we met. In all honesty, it is a phrase that would have remained hollow and abstract for me, a mere idea, a dime store Nietzscheanism, were it not for three things. The first is the extraordinary life Svetlana lived, a life that overcame obstacles that would have defeated most of us very early on, a life that was self-made to a degree our free market friends could scarcely dream of. The second, of course, is the extraordinary array of accomplishments in scholarship, in literature, in art, and in film that she left behind, some of which have yet to appear publicly. The third, of course, is her shaping influence as a teacher, a mentor, and a colleague, which others have attested to here today. I want to say that in fashioning herself, she indirectly and sometimes directly helped to fashion others. And she did it, though it may seem paradoxical to put it this way, selflessly with the greatest generosity of spirit imaginable. Not having Svetlana's originality and frankly defeated by my task, I must end with what I am afraid is yet another cliche. The life is over, yet the memories and the work remain. Though she is gone, she will remain always with us. Hi, I'm Serge Ryapo, uh, a student of Svetlana's, um, or Sergei Ryapo. Um, a poem by Mandelstam. A body's given me, what shall I do with it? So singular and so much mine. For the quiet joy of breathing and living, tell me, who have I to think? I am the gardener, I am the flower too. I am not lonely in the prison of the world. Already on the window panes of eternity, my breathing, my warmth has settled. A pattern is imprinted on it, unrecognizable of late. Let the lees of the moment trickle down. The gentle pattern cannot be effaced. And in Russian. Dano mne tiela, Что мне делать с ним, таким единым и таким моим? За радость тихую дышать и жить, кого скажите мне благодарить? Я и садовник, я же и цветок. А в темнице мира я не одинок, 
Но стекла вечности уже лягло, Мое дыхание, мое тепло. Запечатляется на нем узор, Неузнаваемый с недавних пор. Пускай мгновение стекает чуть, Узора милого не зачеркнуть. Gessen. And Svetlana and I uh, left the Soviet Union at the same time in 1981, were in the transit camp in Vienna at the same time, got to Boston in April 1981, and um, picked out the same cafe on Charles Street and on Beacon Hill called Romano's, where we spent endless, endless hours without ever meeting. <laughs> We didn't actually meet until the mid-90s uh, during a conference in Moscow. And in the 20 years after, Svetlana occasionally reproached me for not having taken an interest in her earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Our roughly 20 years of friendship contained several periods of near silence lasting a year or two. At the end of each, one of us would reappear with a capsule update. <coughs> Mine contained the recent events of my life. Svetlana's described entire new lives. Once she wrote that she was now a visual artist. She used Russian phrasing. She wrote, Я молодой художник. That could be read as either a beginner artist or a young artist. Adding that she was meeting many new people whom she tried to keep at a certain distance, lest they see that she is not so молодой a художник after all. <laughs> That must have been more than a dozen years ago, when Svetlana was in her early 40s. And to hear her tell it, she simply found herself photographing things, fire hydrants early on, and architectural cracks, and experimenting with digital printing and multiple exposures, and the 16-second video option on early digital cameras, and somehow just becoming a visual artist. She loved accidents, and she loved to portray her work as somehow accidental or incidental. In fact, she loved mystery and she loved shadow play and the play of reflections. And I will also quote uh, from the scenographer of friendship. Uh, it was also one of her own favorite pieces of her own writing. It's the essay on the friendship between Hannah Arendt and Mary McCarthy. Um, and she wrote that it was a sort of intimacy that resisted knowledge, quote, Friendship is not about having everything illuminated or obscured, but about conspiring and playing with shadows, she wrote. Its goal is not enlightenment, but luminosity, not a quest for the blinding truth, but only for occasional lucidity and honesty." End quote. Once after reading a book of mine, she said, you write very directly, don't you? And I don't think it was a compliment. <laughs> um, last winter, uh, when she learned she was ill, also happened to be a winter that I was spending in Boston. So we spent a very intense several months together. And um, um, one of the things we started doing was recording interviews about Svetlana's life. Partly, I think, um, partly was sort of compensating for having been friends for so long, but having always lived in different cities uh, with a, cu a couple of years of exception. And so having not gone through sort of an exchange of facts that many people would have gone through, although perhaps that would have been the design of a friendship with Svetlana anyway. Mm. But we tried to record a sort of intellectual autobiography. We didn't get very far, in part because Svetlana kept growing frustrated with me because I could never ask her questions that she hadn't already answered in her writing or in her thoughts. Um, and she wanted me to discover something that she had not yet considered. She did agree to talk a lot about emigration a topic on which she was once again focusing in her writing. Her personal story of it began with standing in line for salted dry fish on a beach in Crimea. A young man struck up a conversation and almost immediately asked if she wanted to move to America with him, and she said yes. <laughs> she imagined the West would be a sequence from an Antonioni film with Maria Schneider's hair endlessly blowing in the wind of freedom. In fact, immigration consisted of more than a year of waiting for an exit visa, followed by the transit camps in Vienna and in Rome, followed by landing in Boston, where she lucked into a series of terrible administrative jobs, 
But what she really wanted to do was study philosophy, so she went to Boston University and knocked on doors. Around this time, she invented a new identity. She had learned Spanish in Leningrad, and the skill of teaching the language was what she chose to market, in part by passing herself off as Shoshana, the daughter of a child refugee from the Spanish Civil War. <laughs> Between knocking on professors' do doors and telling this story, she somehow got some teaching hours and some senior, uh, some senior scholars' attention. And when she told this story, she repeatedly emphasized that nothing of the sort could happen now in the academia in which she worked. <coughs> she was admitted to a master's program, concentrated on Spanish language literature, wrote her first paper in <coughs> Spanish, and got a B plus, because the paper's poetry, according to the professor, overshadowed its argument. <laughs> Svetlana, or Shoshana, was devastated by the low mark. Then a professor gave her Bart, Foucault, and Derrida to read, and a new life began. And this was when I asked the one question that Svetlana found genuinely satisfying. She had just come from a country with Mar where Marxist theory was unknown, but people believed that they were living Marxism. The thinkers, whose, the thinkers whose writing was about to change her life were in conversation with the theory. How did she understand it? She didn't, she said, and took a bite of an apple. <laughs> and um, we're recording these interviews, uh, thinking that perhaps we would um, use them in a podcast at some point. So I took, I took a pause, I waited for her to, to chew the apple, and I said, so could you answer the question about Marxism? And she took another bite of the apple. <laughs> <laughs> this happened three or four times, and finally I said, what's with the apple? <laughs> she said, it's a Freudian apple, I'm trying not to choke on Marxism. <laughs> And then she said she didn't understand uh, the conversation that these philosophers, these were, uh, thinkers were having with Marxism, but she said there was a playfulness to them. I trusted playfulness and humor. The intonation represented an entirely different approach to thinking, perhaps the very thing that she had been seeking when she looked for a way to study in the US. And then, um, I'm not going to run through the, 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 the much of the work that she did, uh, which has al already been mentioned. But the idea for the last uh, uh, of, of her books, the, um, Another Freedom, t had its roots in a dinner party that we attended together in Moscow in August 1999. Um, because we were apparently perceived as guests of some prestige, we were seated <coughs> with two, uh, two men, one of whom had bankrolled the dinner. And his name was Gosha. And uh, as soon as we learned that Svetlana came from Boston, the other one's name was Losha. Uh, as, as, uh, as soon as Gosha and Losha learned that Svetlana had come from Boston, Gosha learned, launched into a tirade about what an unfree country America was. How can you live there, he roared. It's as private property, no trespassing, everywhere. There's no freedom. I thought Svetlana would get annoyed. She was actually fascinated. And this conversation went on for hours. <laughs> and um, after that, Svetlana said, maybe I'll write about it. Maybe I'll write about different concepts of freedom. And about a year or two after uh, that dinner, something moved me to check in with Gosha and find out what, what he was up to. It turned out he had sold his wine importing business and went back to university to study philosophy. <laughs> Um, the, uh, another freedom came out in 2010, and by this time, Svetlana had stopped coming to Russia, where she had been published and had spoken at conferences throughout the 90s. She told me she had lost interest. She visited a couple of times in 2012-2013 for a conference or a show, but she came reluctantly. She would rather be someplace that had the air of possibility, whether it's Venice or Tel Aviv or the Albanian capital of Tirana, which had an artist for a mayor and whose exhibit at the 2010 at Archite Architectural Biennale in Venice she co-curated. So she left Russia twice, once to become an American intellectual and then again to become a visual artist. For years she taught a course in Nabokov in the fall on Wednesdays from 3 to 5. I audited it in, 20, in uh, 2003. Early in the course she would get students to focus on Nabokov's use of the word syncope to describe immigration in speak memory. The world means a change of rhythm in music or a brief loss of consciousness in life. It's the gap between lives. And what happened to the other lives? Svetlana had a private theory uh, that after one emigrated, the pre-immigration self lingered, perhaps it even lived on, 
inaccessible to the emigre. In the last few years, she looked for those other selves. In an unpublished story, she described the lives she led or might have led. She also went back to the, uh, to the transit camp in which she and other Soviet Jews were ho uh, housed in Vienna in 1981. Its location had been secret and its exist existence had been diligently forgotten by most other residents. At the time of her death, she was finishing a film about the camp and we're going to see it shortly uh, right uh, elsewhere, the, the Dana Palmer. Um, it was not her first film. She was a filmmaker, an artist, a writer, a teacher. She was Svetlana, Shoshana. She was a bit of Zinita, the name her father had wanted to give her in honor of his favorite soccer team, which <coughs> always lost. And she was also Olga Kar. Uh, thank you. A self that seemed glamorous and unfamiliar, but maintain, maintained a Facebook presence and occasionally sent email messages referring to Svetlana in the third person, like some sort of virtual assistant. A couple of years ago, Svetlana announced that she and Olga Kar were merging identities. But then something went awry with her access to her Harvard email, uh, and I started getting messages from Olga Kar with the subject line from Svetlana Boeing. Her personal website had for some reasons, uh, for some time stated that Svetlana Boeing lives parallel lives that sometimes cross. And then they ended. Um, but some of us, still get messages from Olga Carr. And uh, to finish, I'd actually like to read one of those messages. <coughs> it arrived yesterday, and I think it is a message about broken technology that Svetlana would have loved. Good afternoon, good day, good to meet you, good to see you. Have a look, hello, hello, there. Hey, hey there, hi, hi there, how are you? How are you doing? How do you do? How is it going? Nice to meet you, nice to see you. See this, this is it. This is what I wanted to show you. What's happening? What's up? Hi. So, uh, I really want to thank everyone for coming. And we just thought just to very end, maybe with two minutes of reflective nostalgia, uh, to listening to the last of the Goldberg variations.
And please join us next door for the reception. <laughs>